Annyeong doobies! Today, we're gonna turn this $20 bill into this. This is 20 banchans for $20. Let's do a quick rundown of everything we're gonna go over in this video. One, what is banchan? Two, why should you banchan? Three, the different types of banchan. Four, the 20 recipes. And five, how to utilize them. Okay, let's talk about what is banchan. Every Korean meal constitutes of two things, bap and banchan. Bap is rice and panchan is supporting dishes. And notice how I said supporting, not side, because panchan is not your side chick, it's your supporting bitch. It's the different balance and the flavor and the different combinations that create a harmony in your mouth. And why should you make panchan? Well, there's several reasons. One, it's nutritious. Two, it's delicious. Three, it's cheap. And if that's not enough reasons for you, well, girly, you got issues. But Four, it's incredibly versatile. Let's say for example, you have a fresh pot of rice, spinach, bean sprouts, Napa cabbage with a bit of that gochujang, you have a bomb diggity ass bibimbap. <sighs> it's morning and you're having oatmeal again? Don't be so vanilla. Let's give this oatmeal a little bit of sass, culture with a K and savoriness. Top it with some anchovies, a drizzle of sesame oil, bam. That's another delicious nutritional meal, biatch. The point being here is that I'm not Jesse Pinkman, but that's one nutritious, delicious meal, man. Boom. There are endless variations that panchan can give you and it can really spruce up your everyday meal. That's why for many Korean moms, panchan is their saving grace to make every meal feel different without having to cook so much every day. But where you are, you probably don't have this or a Korean mom that will cook for you. But don't worry, you got me and I'll be your Korean mommy and breastfeed you. Mama. Everything you need to know so your fridge is as stocked as a doomsday prepper. Now, before we move on to the main cooking segment, let's go over some of the ingredients. Spinach, Napa cabbage, leeks, green onion, sprouted beans, tomatoes, kama cherry, tofu, salmon, little anchovies, a bit of minced beef, a bit of minced pork, itty bitty little hot dogs, eggs, peppers, both red and green, bell peppers, eggplant, onion, avocados, cucumbers, carrots, garlic, shiitake mushrooms, potatoes, and little mushrooms. And that is it. Keep in mind, this is going to feed four people for an entire week and everything here costed around $85, totaling at $21 around per person. And I guess let's start making 20 banchans. <laughs> JK, I'm excited. <laughs> So the first panchan that we're going to be making today is namur. Namur essentially just means blanched and lightly dressed. Both of these are going to be blanched in hot water and dressed with a little bit of minced garlic and sesame oil and salt. And a very Korean hack, enough garlic to kill a small child. Don't use pre-minced garlic. That's not how garlic should really taste. And another very Korean mom hack is to use the bottom of the knife as almost like a sledgehammer. And you really want to go to pound town with your garlic because that pounding action releases allicin, which is that pungent deliciousness that you imbue with the garlic taste. The reason why I'm not using a mortar and pestle is because I want to do less dishes. We're also going to blanch the cabbage, so I'm just gonna cut it into around four centimeter chunks. Now we're gonna go on to the blanching process. You wanna wait until the water comes to a boiling point. A little ice bath on the side so that the veggies go in, fish it out straight in to ice water so that it preserves the color and the crunchiness. When it's boiling like this, you wanna add in a little bit of salt, kind of like salting pasta water to bring the boiling point even higher. 
This makes sure that the veggies are being boiled at an even higher temperature than 100 degrees. Food science, baby. And you wanna blanch in the order of what imbues out the most color to the least. And just blanch in batches. You don't wanna overcrowd the water and make the temperature of the water drop too much. Then you're just gonna end up with soggy vegetables. Blanching is a great way to preserve the crunchiness of the veggie as well as the color. So it also lasts much better in the fridge than it were to be fresh. See how it's crunchy? And the salt seasoned the cabbage really well from within too. And you don't want to squeeze it too hard and break the fiber completely. We still want that crunchiness and have it like a little pookie bowl. And look how much it shrank in size. It's almost a quarter of its initial volume. It's almost like my titties in the winter. They shrink. And now we're gonna do the bean sprouts next. Same process, even less time. And the reason why we blanched the sprouted beans is to kind of get rid of its inherent body fluidness. You know what I mean? It kind of has that same like baby fartiness as ginkgo nuts. With the bean sprouts, you just want to shake off any excess moisture and you don't want to crush them because the fiber on these are much more delicate. Shake it off, shake it off. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing I pursued a career in cooking, not singing. Next up is the spinach. This is a Korean varietal of winter spinach and they're a bit more hardier. It almost feels like somewhere between kale and spinach. And you want to blanch the spinach last because it's going to make the water green. And you can immediately see, as soon as the spinach hits the hot water, it actually turns even greener. You just want to wring out some of the excess moisture, especially the leaf part. Some nice ASMR. I call it squeaky boots ASMR. Before we start dressing, I'm gonna show you my little arsenal of essential cream condiments. Dun, 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 dun. This is what it looks like. We have sugar, some kochukaru, which is Korean chili, some salt, minced garlic, sesame seeds, sesame oil, and soy sauce. I really wanted to make sure that all these recipes were doable and you didn't have to buy a bunch of ingredients. So everything has five ingredients or less. I got you, I told you. Let's start with the spinach first. A teaspoon of minced garlic, one tablespoon of sesame oil, and you want to use high quality sesame oil because this is what's going to give the most of the aroma. Half a teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of sesame seeds. And the best utensil to dress namu are these flanges. We have the saying in Korea, solmat, which means the taste of the hand. It means like a sixth sense when it comes to cooking. You kind of know how it tastes just by touching the food and dressing it. Let me give it a taste test. So uh, winter is probably the best time to have spinach in Korea. It's fresh, it's green. If you have a bag of spinach, do not lie to yourself and say that you're gonna have it for salad tomorrow. Just blanch it, dress it in some sesame oil, sesame seeds, salt, and garlic, and it's just gonna be a thousand times better. And it's just really, really good. And it lasts longer too. Now for the sprouted beans, one tablespoon of kochukaru, one teaspoon of salt, one tablespoon of soy sauce, one teaspoon of minced garlic, two teaspoons of sesame seeds, one tablespoon of sesame oil. This is a very common side dish at a lot of Korean restaurants because it's nutritious, it's delicious, and it's different from bean sprouts. Sprouted beans come from soybeans. They're less watery and have more fiber to them. Super crunchy, a mm. little spicy, a little salty, garlic kicking in and just very fresh in general. And this is a very, very important factor in having good bibimbap because it adds back moisture. For the Napa cabbage, because it's so sweet and crunchy, I wanna pair it with something a bit more umami and rich, which is gonna be perfect for the fermented soybean paste. I know a lot of people are gonna get triggered, especially Koreans, if I compare it to miso. But for those who've never tried tenjang before, it's a much funkier version of miso. It's more aged, it's more rich. It's kind of like the Parmesan cheese of condiments. And for a half of Napa cabbage, one tablespoon of tenjang sugar, one teaspoon of soy sauce, one tablespoon of sesame oil. Because the tenjang is quite pungent and strong, we're kind of 
offsetting it with a little bit of sugar. Let me give it a taste test. It's sweet, it's crunchy, mm. and umami rich saltiness. So very different from these two where it's a bit more light. This feels more indulgent. Let me plate this up and make it look pretty for some B-rolls. Real doobies will know that I don't like cucumber salad, but this is one of my mom's best dishes and Kevin likes cucumbers, so I learned how to make it. Is that you wanna rub salt on it to kind of get rid of some of the pimply aspects of it. And what I like to do is score the flesh a little bit so that the salt is gonna penetrate better and all that sauce can really seep in. Just around five millimeter from the skin and then same on the other side but I like to give it a little bit more of a directional angle just so that it doesn't cut it into complete rounds. And then now I'm gonna cut these into quarters or an even size. Then these are all gonna go in here. One tablespoon of salt. We're not gonna be consuming all this salt. It's just to briefly pickle it and season it so that it doesn't get too watery when we dress it. And naturally the water should come out through osmosis because if something is saltier than the other, moisture is gonna get drawn out. And we're just gonna let this sit for about 10 minutes. And while we do that, let's chop some onion. Time for the sauce two tablespoons of kochukaru, one tablespoon of kochujang. It's kind of like a sweeter, thicker version of the kochukaru. And it's fermented, so it adds a different element of spice. One tablespoon of vinegar, one tablespoon soy sauce, one tablespoon sugar, one teaspoon minced garlic, and as always, a teaspoon of sesame oil. And it makes this very thick paste that you would think is too thick to dress any sort of vegetable, but because the cucumber is gonna let out some of the natural moisture, it's gonna be easy to dress later on. I'm just gonna wash it in cold water and start mixing. Okay, now the onions go in, our sauce goes in, and you dress it. Definitely feels a little thick, but in a couple of minutes, all that water is gonna come out. And just let this sit in the fridge for about half a day, that's when it becomes the best because the cucumber is gonna absorb all that sauce. But for the sake of juicy B-roll plating, let's plate it now. Now we're gonna move on to sauteing, which is called bukum in Korean. And sauteing is a great way to really brings out the natural sweetness in any of the ingredients. And I'm gonna work in the order of doing the least amount of dishes. Right here, I have a mandolin with me. What's a little different about this mandolin versus most is that it has teeth. So oh, they're really useful because you don't have to use a chopping block and it will julienne your vegetables beautifully. Okay, I think that's good enough because I would rather have my finger than a little more carrot. Trust me, just use this for something else. It's not worth risking it. So now that the carrots are ready, I am gonna get the ingredients for the mushroom saute. These are baby king oyster mushrooms. So I guess it makes them junior oyster mushrooms. In order to maximize the surface area for caramelization, I'm just gonna have it. Just to expedite the whole process, I'm gonna get the prep for each section done first so we can just boom, boom, boom. Onion. This is actually an average size. Very simple, very easy. It's just sauteing carrots. A little bit of salt, a bit of 
sesame oil. You always want to add sesame oil at the last because the burning point, the smoke point is very low. It's really almost like a nice extra virgin olive oil. It's really that finishing touch. The thing with panchan is that it's not super elaborate dishes. It's really all ingredient focused. Same pan, I'm just gonna wipe it with some paper towel. Mushroom, you really need a lot of oil so that it browns evenly. You can hear all the mushrooms screaming. That's because it's all that moisture escaping through the fibers. Isn't it glorious? Welcome to my health inferno. You wanna just push the mushroom to the side. We're gonna put one tablespoon of soy sauce and burn it. Look how it's scalding. That taste of burnt soy is really nice. It's developing really deep notes of soy. I'm gonna add half a tablespoon of sugar, just dissolve it, and then add back our mushrooms. And look how the sugar dissolves to almost create like a caramel. Very few ingredients, but it's the technique that really takes it to another level. Gorgeous. Same pan, now low heat. We wanna toast the walnuts as well as the anchovies. And to help with the toasting process, the roasting process helps get rid of the overly fishy notes as well as some of the bitter notes that the anchovy could have and also makes the walnuts nuttier. But you wanna be careful because it can really burn quickly. So just keep stirring. When the anchovies start looking golden brown, you wanna just push it to the side and create a ring. And same technique as before, we're going to caramelize the soy sauce. This is really to add a little bit of that aroma because anchovies are already salty as is. A tablespoon of sugar and we're going to melt it. If you feel like there's too much that's stuck on the bottom of the pan it's, and it's slightly burning, just add a, a tablespoon of water. The water is gonna help deglaze that toasted soy. I'm gonna turn the heat off add a tablespoon of roasted sesame seeds and mix it in. If the Italians have olives, Koreans have sesame and garlic. Two of the most important ingredients I would say in Korean cuisine. Now is a time for a little pan rinse. Sausage stir fry begins now. And first goes in the veggies. And once the onions are slightly translucent, you wanna add the sausages in. Full spoons of ketchup goes in. Now goes in one tablespoon of soy sauce and a little crack of black pepper. Plating time. Now we're gonna move on to chang. Chang means a salted fermented condiment. So we have ganjang, which is soy sauce, gochujang, our fermented red chili paste, which we used earlier, and tuenjang, which is fermented soybean paste. We're essentially preserving food in salty things so it lasts longer. We're gonna make my mom's favorite dish that I make, which is yakgochujang with beef and gochujang. We're gonna do two tablespoons of oil. Now we're gonna go on to the sauteing part. We're gonna start with the onions and the leeks and sort it down to bring out the natural sweetness. And then we're gonna add our beef. And you wanna really break it apart so that we don't have big chunks of beef. I'm gonna add a teaspoon of salt to season the beef. And a little bit of black pepper as well. You can see all the beef fat coming out and you wanna slowly render it. And now that the beef has almost cooked through, we're gonna do a tablespoon of minced garlic. We're doing two tablespoons of soy sauce and drizzle it along the outside. And in the center where there's this beef, leek, onion, garlic fat, and just like you would with tomato paste, you wanna just cook out the gochujang. It's gonna become glossy and smooth.
We're gonna balance out some of the saltiness with two tablespoons of sugar, and this is optional. You wanna add the walnuts in last. They add a really nice crunch, and there you have it. Beautiful yakuchujang. Actually, another tip when it comes to yakuchujang, all the flavors become really, really well-rounded the day after, and it just matures well over time. Preservation method two, soy sauce. We're gonna be preserving proteins and soy sauce. We'll be doing egg yolks, salmon, and for my vegetarian friends, avocados. And I'll show you sauce that you can use for anything. I'm doing one cup of soy sauce, one fourth cup of sugar, one and a half cup of water, four cloves of garlic, and I'm just gonna gently crush it to release the allicin, half an onion, and half a leek. And you wanna simmer this until the leeks and the onions have released all its juices. And this is gonna be kind of a bed of layer for the sliced salmon to sit on. And because I like a little bit of spice, because I'm Korean, I'm gonna thinly slice some chilies. I didn't wanna just do only like strictly traditional Korean recipes. I also wanted to put in a bit of a modern take. And for avocados, you wanna choose one that's just a tiny bit unripe, because if you choose one that's really ripe and perfect for something like guacamole, it's gonna get too mushy and it's not gonna preserve. So you want something with a little bit of bite that can hold up to the liquid so that it doesn't become sludge. And for avocado jang, you want to slice it on the thicker side around one centimeter. This is so that it can also hold up and it doesn't get mushy. And have your knife be on edge so that the avocado won't follow your knife. And I'm going to transfer these straight into the lock and lock. And this is what it looks like. So pretty. I like to put it face side up because it looks more beautiful. And only for the avocado, you wanna add one tablespoon of lemon juice or vinegar to make sure that the avocados don't oxidize. Next is gonna be the salmon. And for the salmon, make it a little thicker than what you would usually have for sushi. And you wanna gently lay the salmon on top of a bed of onions. Sprinkle a little bit of the pepper mix. And you wanna let the marinade cool completely before pouring it on because we don't wanna cook the salmon. So meanwhile, I'm gonna prepare the eggs. Marinated egg yolks. Just wanna gently drop only the yolks in. To all those trypophobia people, trigger warning, too late. And now you wanna slowly drizzle in the marinade. which is a soy pickled vegetable. We're gonna be doing green onion and tomatoes. It really lasts a long time because it's higher in acidity. Cut it to the width of your container. So like this, so pretty. And for the tomatoes, a little bit extra work, but you need to peel it in order for the marinade to really get through the skin. And what you wanna do is make a cross section on the top when it's simmering. You want to drop the tomatoes in. It should start opening up like a little octopus. And when it does, it's time to come out. And you want to shock it in cold water. Half cup soy, half cup sugar, and half cup vinegar. And one cup water. And you want to bring this to a boil. And gently pour the marinade on top of the tomatoes and the green onions. And it's very important to pour the marinade while it's hot because we're pickling it essentially. Potato kamjajorim, and it's braising potatoes in sweet soy sauce. You want to cube the potatoes up around bite size. Not all pieces have to look the same because it's the difference that makes us beautiful. Aww. 
And we're also going to be making another braise, which is tofu. And I'm gonna cut it into squares. Potato first. That's gonna be my presidential slogan. Potato first, coming to elections, 2028. Oil, and drop your potatoes in. And now is the time to add in a tablespoon of sugar, four tablespoons of soy sauce, a cup of water, and we're gonna braise it until most of the liquid has finished absorbing. My little pookie is looking tanned and gorgeous. Oh, it's gonna be hot. Salt the tofu on both sides to draw out excess moisture. And what is this phenomenon? Osmosis! There's really two food science terms that really happen so much in the kitchen and it's osmosis and caramelization. Those two, you should know. And why do we want to draw out moisture? It helps caramelize better because less moisture means less steaming and more crust forming. And crust means good. Unlike your crusty, dusty ass. Now, tofu is quite delicate, and if you're not very comfortable with using carbon steel pans, I would recommend you to use a non stick because it will stick well. But if you wanna learn, two things. You wanna heat the pan so hot that even water, see, will glide off it. And be generous with the oil amount, drop your tofu in and away from you so it doesn't splatter and just let it be. Be the opposite of an Asian parent and just take a step back and watch. And when it's ready, it will release. Look, it'll just glide right off. Put the onion on top as well as all the other vegetables. Four tablespoons of soy sauce two tablespoons of kochukaru, one tablespoon sugar, one tablespoon minced garlic, and half cup water. And you close the lid and let it braise for 10 minutes. Ah. Do you know how happy the color red makes me? The next technique that we're gonna talk about is steaming. And we have a newest addition to our team, Chef Mikey D. Can you imagine in the 1960s, are used to just cooking everything stovetop and this comes out of nowhere? Like it's a time machine if you think about it. It takes you from one place to another so fast. We're gonna be making two steamed dishes. One is gonna be eggplant and other is gonna be that without the plant. So just egg, steamed egg. We're gonna steam this in a microwave. And I know to a lot of foodies that is sacrilegious, but trust me, it actually works really well. Eggplant is one of those vegetables that has a lot of internal moisture. And when you microwave it, it kind of steams from within, becoming really soft and sweet. I'm gonna add one tablespoon of water just to help with a little bit of that steaming process. Chef Mickey D for three to four minutes. The Chamber of Secrets. These are super duper hot, so just let it cool while we make the sauce. Two tablespoons of soy sauce, one teaspoon of minced garlic, one tablespoon sesame seed, one tablespoon sesame oil, and one tablespoon of sliced green onions. Hold it in the middle and just rip it apart. Ah! You wanna follow this grain to squeeze out some of the excess moisture so it can really absorb the sauce. Dress it. This is our steamed eggplant panchan. Taste test. Mmm, 
and you would never ever be able to tell that this was microwaved. Next one, steamed egg. Two eggs goes in, half teaspoon salt, and we whisk, obviously using chopsticks. And once the egg is nice and homogenous, we're gonna add one cup of water. I'm gonna top it off with some green onion, half teaspoon of sesame oil, and into the microwave it goes for three and a half minutes. I'm a peeping Tom. My money don't jiggle jiggle, it folds. And chan is Korean fritters. And the one that I'll be making today is called Dongrangdaeng, which are essentially flatter Korean meatballs. And we're gonna be using that filling and stuff it into shiitake mushrooms as well. And you want to incorporate everything in really, really well. Think about it as the size of an IKEA meatball is a good reference. Let's also prep the shiitake mushroom. You just wanna remove the stem, dust everything in flour to the center and press them down like this. Once more with flour, beautiful. We're gonna dust the rest of these meatballs also, flip them around and we're ready to pan fry. Pretty. You want to put it meat side down so it really adheres and you can get a nice crust forming. And for this, in order to cook both the egg and the meat, you want to go low and slow, even more so than before. Shall we do a rundown of everything we've cooked together? We have Hongnamur Muchim, Pechunamur, Shigumchi Namur, Oi Muchim, Tangum Bokum, Pasok Bokum, Merchi Bokum, Sausage Bokum, Yakko Chujang, Avocado Jang, Yono Jang, Nurunja Jang, Tomato Jangachi, Chokpa Jangachi, Kamja Jorim, Tubu Jorim, Keran Chim, Kaji Chim, Tungurang Tang, Pyo Bosot Jang. I'm proud of myself. Very proud of myself. We did this. Every single one of it. We really did this, doobies. Eight techniques, 20 different dishes. I'm gonna be honest with you and break the third wall for a bit. We started filming this at around 10 a.m. today and it's now past midnight, so it took over 12 hours to film. It wasn't the individual cooking process that took a long time, but it was, you know, filming and getting everything set up and recipe testing that took a long time. Honestly, my back feels like it's about to break. At least I can die happy looking at all these beautiful food. I feel like this was something that I had to do to do 20 essential panchans of all my favorite childhood recipes has been incredibly fulfilling for me. It's honestly brought back a lot of memories of my grandma who's been a great inspiration for my cooking. And I really feel bad because I used to be such a picky eater and she would make so many panchans for me and I would complain all the time about the panchan selection. And now that I've done all of this and know how much labor of love it is, I have a newfound respect for all the moms and grandmas and the dads and anyone else who is cooking for their children or for their families. I have major, major respect. I can't wait to eat all of this though. This all looks so good. 